Welcome everybody to another World Sprout event. Uh, tonight we have a really special event and we're joined by filmmaker Livy Jung, who I will introduce here in a second. I just wanna thank everybody for taking the time to hop on with us during the holidays. This is actually the last World Sprout event for 2021. So uh, thank you again, everybody for joining. Um, and as I mentioned, we're joined uh, tonight with a very special guest. And to kick things off, I'm gonna go ahead and just show a quick sizzle reel before I formally introduce Libby. You need to listen to me, Captain, because I'm about to tell you something that cannot leave this office. Is that understood? All right, but it better be damn good. react to your movement. That was the greatest feeling I had, even still now. Incredible feeling. Everything that we just watched was either filmed, directed, and or produced by Livy Jung herself. So um, I'm so happy that we got to watch that. And with that, I will go ahead and introduce Livy. Livy Jung is an Indonesian producer, director, and stunt woman. She began her career as a stunt woman at the age of 18 and has since produced and directed films such as Brush with Danger, Bali Beats of Paradise, and Insight. Livy has spoken and lectured worldwide, including at Yale, USC, UCLA, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and many others. She holds her bachelor in economics from the University of Washington at Seattle and her master's in film production from USC. I've had the privilege of knowing Livy myself for several years. We've worked together in a professional capacity and we've also become really good friends. Um, I've had the privilege of hanging out with her in, in LA and in Houston and even in Beijing. One time we actually got to hang out together for a couple of days, which was super fun. Um, so I'm so honored to have you here with us tonight, Livy, and welcome. Thank you. Absolutely. It's a, it's a you know, I've, we've been doing a lot of different events throughout the month and, and this kind of, um, is almost like the icing on the cake of everything. So I, this is a really special opportunity and I'm glad to have you. So I'll just kind of get right into it, Libby. Um, I'd love to kind of unpack a little bit more about your story. Uh, you've broken many barriers in film. Uh, not only did you shoot your first film in your early twenties, but as a female and a Chinese Indonesian filmmaker, you've helped pave the way for others in Hollywood. And so in, in a huge sense, you're really a trailblazer. Uh, I would love to, if you could just tell us a little bit about that journey. So I started um, doing martial arts since I was young. That's kind of how I got into film. I was doing stunt work and 
I did a show back in Asia and, you know, I really loved it. And I eventually like thought, you know, if I want to tell my own story, I have to be either a producer, director or writer, but I don't write very well. So I guess I decided to be a producer and director. So I was uh, working as an assistant producer um, for a few years and finally like just did um, my own film. So I kind of took a lot of like, you know, um, detour along the way, just because like my family is not in film. So, you know, when your family is not in ours, it's, you kind of don't know how to get there. You know, you don't know like, oh, how do I become a filmmaker? How do I become a producer or director? So I studied economics um, for undergrad because I thought, you know, um, that's kind of like a good, good major to have it applies to like everything you know and yeah I'm glad I did it because I learned a little bit about law a little bit about accounting and you know just kind of the general like business um and it really helps also in my filming but during uh, my study in uh, Seattle I started working on like uh, short films and taking like film classes and at that moment like I realized like film is really what I want to do and it's really my passion so I decided to like um, start um, like developing like uh, my first film which is Brush with Danger which uh, I was at the time I think 23 working with my brother and you know just kind of like doing that um, the two of us and then we got like uh, more people to help us uh, eventually and I also decided to uh, apply to USC film school thinking that I probably won't get accepted. And then I got accepted because their acceptance rate is very like low. I think it's like 5% or something like that. And I didn't really have like, you know, like that big portfolio or anything, um, but I got in. So I feel like, oh, this is like a sign, you know, that I have to work in film. And um, since then has been working on film. We do commercial, commercial corporate video, branded content, documentaries. Um, just has been like doing a variety of things and until now, since uh, many, many years ago. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, I love, I love how you just kind of got into it, but like even before uh, you were making films, you were involved with martial arts, right? Yes, I did. Yeah. I, that's why I started like um, actually as a stunt woman, I did a lot of wire work fights. Um, and then just from there, just kind of, uh, starting to see like how the sets work and everything like that and I was like oh this is really cool you know so I just kept going from there and that, that, that's so amazing how, how did you get into martial arts initially so actually um, you know how like uh, each family have like let's say a, like a weekend tradition you know so my family's was like like my mom my brother my dad we all do martial art class every Sunday and then after we do the class we would go eat so it's always like really fun, especially the eating part afterwards. And <laughs> we just go like once a week, you know, and, but you know, it's, it's nothing like super serious. It was more like a fun thing, you know, like um, that we did, but me and my brother ended up um, uh, becoming like competitive in martial art. And um, we like went competition. I went like US Open as well, like here. Um, and then did the, the state championship as well um, while I was in Washington. And, you know, we just kind of ended up like taking it to the next level. And um, yeah, so that's how we kind of started um, doing the martial art. Yeah, it's so interesting too, because it seems like martial arts has, even though that was kind of your, your beginning, you also incorporate martial arts in some of your films, especially your action films. And yeah. it, correct me if I'm wrong, like in, in Brush with Danger, it's actually you and your brother acting in the movie as well, right? Yes, we did. We did all our own stunts as well and like the fights and everything. Right. That's so cool. And then, but, and then from there, you kind of tr started a transition um, into other types of storytelling. So with um, like with Bali Beats of Paradise, for example, that's really more of like a documentary just on Bali. So yeah. I'm, I'm curious... Um, like many people, you straddle multiple cultures and countries. Um, you're Indonesian by nationality, but Chinese Indonesian ethnically. And now, I mean, you're American, you live here in the US and you've lived here for a while. So 
Uh, would you say that culture plays a role in your identity and the way that you tell stories? Yes, for sure. It definitely play a big part, um, you know, in, in uh, my, my, my filmmaking. Cause you know, you, 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 you see, so you, you like make stories that touches you. Right. And like people and culture, that's like something that like we experience. And I always like, so I, I grew up actually, maybe like, let's go back a little bit. Like, so I was born in Indonesia, grew up in Indonesia and then moved to uh, Beijing when I was like, I think 15 in high school. And then I went to college in the U S and I have lived here ever since, ever since. So, um, a lot of like the stories I, I make is based on like, on like, you know, my, uh, like when I live in Indonesia, I live in China and then also live in the U S and I think it's really important to also always remember your roots, where you come from, because it's actually your strength. Like, like I know like um, Indonesia and like Beijing and like, you know, like now living in LA, like really well, right? So um, it actually adds that like, you're different than other people, you know, and that that your roots is actually your strength. So, and you always like, want to remember that you know like sometimes like you know like um there's actually like for example um in Bali Beats of Paradise we bring up um about like gamelan Indonesian uh traditional uh music right like you know in Indonesia like everybody know gamelan right but it's it's actually so special gamelan has been used in the film Avatar has been has been used in the tv series Star Trek you know and it's it's so special that because you're you have it there. Sometimes you don't really know how special it is, you know. Um, so I think like moving to different parts of the world, it's like it makes me realize, oh, you know, this is like so unique to this place. This is so unique to that place, and this culture is so unique, you know. And you kind of like have just that much more appreciation, like on what you have, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think it, it takes people like you to kind of bridge that story and that message across cultures because you're Indonesian, but you've lived in the U.S. for so long and you've studied here. And so I think for, for Americans, it's really useful to have somebody who understands both cultures because then you know how to introduce something like Gamelan, right? And kind of its, uh, its cultural significance. And, and with that, I would actually like to show everybody the trailer for uh, Beats of Paradise, if that's okay. Yes, yeah, sure. Awesome. So I will go ahead and bring this up. Um, and if anybody is interested, this is a really cool documentary. So I would highly recommend um, you rent it. We'll just show you the trailer. Being an artist is not really easy. A lot of up and down, 14 hours every day. But this is my dream. It's, it's hard to separate the life without music and dance for us. Dance and music is like food to our soul. I like to introduce the art of music and dance of Bali to the world beyond Bali. It's a very exciting journey to see what we'll come up with and how we can create that world. I get the idea to make a music video reads not only 100, 200, 1,000, but a million people. <laughs> to have a million views? I love that. I love that film. And just for the people on the phone who are on the call who haven't uh, watched it. So it's, it's really, it's a story about 
in one sense about gamelan music, which is um, in a style of Indonesian music, but it really kind of chronicles this famous musician and his quest to bring uh, gamelan music kind of to a wider mainstream audience. And they do that by pairing up with Judith Hill, who's a famous singer here in the US. Um, I don't know if, I, if I've explained that properly, Livy, but uh, um, Earl from the, from the call says, great trailer. So well, thank you. Yeah, and so, so just to kind of get, get into that for a little bit, I, what made you want to make a documentary and especially about gamelan music? So this is actually uh, the Indonesian consulate in LA asked me to make um, kind of like a short video, like a teaser out of a concert that they held. So, and Nyoman Wenten Wenten, which is the basically the main character of this documentary, it's his life story. This documentary is his life story. Uh, he was the, 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 the concert director, the music director. So um, I, because, you know, uh, I'm filming this, so I got to know him. And then I found, after talking to him, I found that his life story is like quite interesting. And I learned actually, learn a lot about gamelan as i mentioned earlier it's been used in avatar tv uh, the tv series star trek you know and even uh as indonesian i didn't know this you know so that was like oh that's really cool you know and i just i just thought you know i don't think i've seen like a film that like you know really highlight in this sense and and like we, i want to make a kind of like a, a documentary that showcase like the beauty of like um Bali and the Indo Indonesian um, culture, music, you know, and arts, and um, and I just haven't seen like something like that. And I figured, you know what, like I really want to make this a uh, like a, a full length like a uh, feature film because when you make it a feature film, it can it it um, it plays in theater, it plays in the TV, it can play in the like for example like Singapore Airlines bought the rights to Bali Visa Paradise, so it was playing on the plane, you know. Um, and of course, like nowadays, if you make a short film, you can put it on YouTube, right? But when it's in the theater, it's in the plane, it's like in different, the more places you have it, the more likely people will watch it. That's why I think it was a better fit to make this a feature film. So I just kind of decided to like, I asked the Indonesian um, Consul General, I'm like, you know, I really want to make this a feature film, you know, like, I think it would be really cool. It was like, sure, you know, because it was already like his idea to make all this, right? And so, yeah, so that's why if you see like the executive producer, it's say ambassador, because um, he became the Indonesian ambassador in Korea, in uh, Seoul. And um, yeah, so that's how, you know, that's how I got um, Bali Beats like into like a feature film. And it was really a lot of fun, like filming in, uh, Bali, like so we film in LA, we film in um, Boston, and we film in Bali. And even as Indonesian, there's still like so much to learn uh, about like the different culture. Indonesia has like more than 17,000 island. So even if you're born there, you're probably like never gonna like visit each island, you know? So it's it was kind of cool. Like, and I've been to Bali like many times as, you know, just visiting as a tourist. And, I do see the um, the culture and the different tradition, but it's just so different once you like go like deeper. Oh wow, there's like all these things that I've like didn't know as a tourist visiting and just you know going to resort, restaurant, and like shopping, you know. So that was like really even cool to learn. Like and while we were filming the documentary, like you know sometimes we would just see something and just stop. And one time there was like a wedding. We were like there's some. Um, procession we were like what is that you know so we we stopped the car came out it was a wedding and actually they invited us and we were like hey can we film a little bit you know just a few minutes because we we're doing this stuff and they're like yeah and then they actually didn't let us go home go to our next shot they wanted us to stay they give us food I mean it was like and we just met them like we know nobody there and they were like just give all the crew like their the, the like a feast you know like huge a lot of me like and they were very welcoming they were like no 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 don't go no we have to shoot you know because that's like not even the plan to film this wedding it just kind of happened and they were like no don't go so we stayed there and chatted and it was really cool like and bali is a very like community-based 
um, culture. So it was really cool to kind of just experience that um, firsthand, you know? And while we were filming, we like stayed with, with the locals and just kind of like, kind of like, it's different, you know, when you go there as stories and you're staying at a resort and you're staying with the locals and just what they do every day and that kind of thing, it's very fascinating actually. Even I'm also Indonesian, you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, you know, I've, I had the, I'm lucky enough that I actually went to Bali for my honeymoon. So I kind of did the tourist, the, the whole tourist thing, but I got to see, you know, just a little bit um, of the culture there and how distinct it really is. I mean, so I, I was in Jakarta and then Bali um, and they're completely different. Right. Yeah. Like, uh, so I think it was so cool, like watching your film because it unpacks some of that, like some of the unique aspects of Bali as well. Um, and, and on that note, I, I'm really curious. So, you know, when you first moved to the U.S., um, I imagine that you had some moments of culture shock kind of initially coming from Indonesia. Uh, would you mind sharing like just a couple of those stories, if, if, if you don't mind? Actually, yeah, when I first came to the U.S., a lot of things were different. For example, like, you know, when I first came here, like, probably the first six months, every Saturday, I do laundry and iron everything, you know? But then, like, in here, because I think you get to use dryer, the clothes look fine. So now I don't iron anything. So, but that's, that's really good. It really saves time, right? Because in Indonesia, we iron, like, everything, you know? So it's really like six time. It was like, oh, this is cool. Like you just like hang in and then it's great, you know? So I really like that I don't have to spend time ironing. So after six months, I give that up, but it was kind of still nice that, you know, and just once in a while you need to iron, but for most of the time, the dryer does the job, you know? So that was pretty cool. And then um, I think like in here, like there's like, it's like unlimited soda, unlimited <laughs> drinks. And it, that was like, oh, you just pay this and then you can get all, you know, however many you want. I mean, it's just like, whoa, okay. You know, <laughs> like this, that's, that's, you know, this, I think like different, like, cause you know, in Indonesia, even you go like McDonald's, you order the drink and they, I think they just give you like, you know, medium or like, you know, the, the, the cup and then that's it, you know, it's not like unlimited. And uh, also like another thing that was like different that like in here, in the US, like, I think it's expected that you tip, right? Like that was kind of different, like, cause in Indonesia we do tip, but it's not, I don't think it's expected. Like if you really like the person you can tip, but I think the standard people don't really tip, you know, uh, especially like in the like restaurant, they just give you the bill and then, you know, that's the, the amount. Um, there's also like, I think like in here, like the taxes is not included. Right. You see something like 99 cents. It's not actually 99 cents. So that that's kind of like, get, got used to that. Like, you know, I have to get used to that. Um, what else? I mean, that's kind of like, you know, oh, right. you know, like another one that's actually, that's very, very different. You know, like in, um, in uh, Indonesian or Chinese, like, you know, you call it JJ, you know, Mei Mei and like, like Mr. In, in here, like, I had a professor who was like 80 years old and he's like, oh, just call me by my first name. And I was like, <laughs> what? And then I, I kept calling him like professor and he felt like really uncomfortable that I'm calling him like Mr. and professor. Um, and he was like, no, 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 call me like my first name. And like, I'm like, we're very used to like adding, like, especially with somebody older, you add like, you know, like uh, Mr. or like, even if it's slightly older, you go like big brother or something or uncle or something like that. And that was like, it was a little bit hard to like get used to that, you know, especially like somebody that's like 80 years old, you know, and they look like significantly like older. And then you just get, hey, you know, in the name, it's like, whoa, okay, you know, like, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a much less formal here right especially with with just kind of people you don't know yeah yeah I, I think that's kind of something that Americans don't really understand because it's that way in a lot of a lot of countries like the the formality especially with strangers you know like Spanish there's different ways to address somebody different language you use I know in, in most uh international languages it's that way but in the U.S. it's just you know it's part of our history that everything is kind of just like informal 
And so that's always like, a, I, I think for Americans who don't really travel often, they just kind of make that mistake all the time and they're real informal. But then for those who have traveled quite a bit, we're constantly trying to figure out, oh no, like, am I doing this the right way? Like, am I being formal enough? Uh, it's always, at least for me, it's always a source of, of stress. <laughs> um, so I, I want to ask a couple more things and then, and then open it up for questions. Um, so just going back to filmmaking for a bit, you know, I assume for most of us on this call, uh, you know, when we think of filmmaking, it's like this very prestigious and almost pretty rare type of profession. I mean, let's be honest, there aren't many filmmakers. Um, and, and we kind of have this romantic idea of it, but I'm curious your take on it. Like, what is the average day of a filmmaker like? So making a film takes actually quite a long time. So for example, like if you make a feature film, uh, it's usually once you have the script. So the script, you know, can take like three months, can take six months, sometimes a year, just depend, you know, how long it takes you. But let's say you have a script, right? To prep for the film, it usually takes to three to six months. That's like um, getting the crew, uh, finding location, casting, um, that kind of stuff. And, and then actually filming is the, the quickest one because usually you film like two to three months. After the filming done, you have to edit, uh, do post-production. Post-production takes quite a long time. It can take six months to a year, sometimes even more. You have to edit it. Once you edit it, you have to uh, edit the sound. You have to edit the dialogue, add the sound effect, add the music, mix everything. And then also do um, color. Cause so for example, like if you're shooting like a three minute dialogue scene, it doesn't take three minutes to shoot it. It probably take like the whole day or like a few hours, right? And the sun changes all the time, but in the movie you wanna look like it's it happened in three minutes. So you, you color correct it so that it kind of look more consistent. Um, and that takes, you know, like um, quite a bit as well. So, so this whole post-production process takes six months to a year so actually like to make like one film it can take one to two years sometimes even more if it has like a lot of visual effect or like animation takes also a long time um so actually when you see like you know the director with the camera and with the actor that's only like maybe two months out of like <laughs> the year you know the rest of the time you're like prepping or meeting you know meeting people and that kind of stuff and then the red carpet that's only like two hours so <laughs> so so yeah it's definitely like it's definitely a rewarding like profession because you're always working with like different project and you feel that sense of completion you know and it's never boring because you're never doing the same thing um so that's what I love about it and you know like when you work when you're on filming um you usually work like 12 hour days 12 hour shooting and when you have to prep and that kind of stuff, it ended up being like 14 plus LA traffic, it's like 16, you know? So, so it's, 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 we have like really long days. Um, but the good thing is like when you're not filming, your life is very flexible. It's almost like a vacation when you're not filming. You can kind of, you know, even if you have something to do, like you can kind of do it in your own time most of the time. Um, so that's what I love about it is like the flexibility, but you know, um, when we do like commercial or that kind of stuff, sometimes they don't give you like a lot of notice. Like when we do commercial and they tell you like a week before. So sometimes it can be hard to like plan a vacation, like, you know, six months prior, you know, like you kind of just do it like a last minute thing. Um, but you know, you can always say no, but because we're like mostly freelancer, you don't want to always say no. Right. Cause then nobody's going to call you again. So yeah, you just tend to like, you know, be have to be more spontaneous about like um, your holidays and vacation. Um, and so yeah, generally like um, I I work on like like a film. Probably like I have like one feature film every like year or two, and then I do a lot of like commercial and corporate video. That's like you know a more consistent because it's like a shorter where maybe like you work for a few days or like a week, maybe a couple of weeks at the most. Um, and then I also do a lot of, you know, I love like teaching since I was really young. 
um, I like volunteered like um, to help out, like teach, you know, like um, kids. And then I also coach. And now I just um, mostly lecture in different universities. Um, so I do that also. And then, um, yeah, that's pretty much, you know, the life of my life. <laughs> It's like every day is something new, uh, which is yeah, cool. every day is something new. <laughs> every day is something new. Sometimes you don't even know, like some, you know, some people, hey, you know, I did this in two weeks. I'm like, I don't even know if I'm filming or not. I'm like, yes, if I don't have filming, you know, like, so yeah. But it it is it is definitely like really really fun. You never and you know the great thing about like being a free freelancer is that you can pick who you want to work with and um what project you want to do for the most part so like probably 99 of the time i really love my job and then that one percent is like i picked the wrong client you know but <laughs> but generally it's you know like 99 of the time like you're doing what you love right the project that you love working with people you like well and kind of on that note actually um so you know you've You've made action movies, you've made documentaries, you've worked with uh, corporate clients filming commercials and, and different types of uh, productions. Um, so what's next? I mean, what's you're still young in your career, you've accomplished a lot, uh, you've gotten international recognition. So, I mean, what's next for Libby Jung? So now our, um, so I, we, 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 I run like um, production company, Sun and Moon Films. So now we're a little bit bigger and we have like more people working with us. So, so we are doing currently now we're doing um, proof of concept for a few different projects. So we're trying to do like three to five projects simultaneously versus like one by one. And that's what we've been doing. And of course we're still doing um, our commercial work as well as corporate work as well. And um, yeah, I think uh, in, the, in a few, maybe in a couple of months, we'll be like um, finishing up with our teasers and then you can probably like see it, you know? Um, and um, yeah, so that's what we've been doing, developing like several projects. And um, yeah, we're very excited like for next year too. Cause during the COVID we didn't want to shoot a full feature film cause you know, it's, it's just like a little bit harder but we've been shooting like the teaser and proof of concept. And hopefully like when the pandemic is, you know, we can like shoot the actual like film. Right, right. Well, I, I'm excited for, for the next film that, that you make. Um, and so I'll definitely be at the theaters to watch it. Uh, and, and for those of you who, who hopped on a little bit late, uh, I'll share some of the trailers and the sizzle reels. Um, you know, I'll share the links for that so that you guys can watch some of Libby's work, but she's she's created some really cool stuff. Um, so with that, I would like to actually open it up to questions. I know um, we're getting towards the end of our conversation. Um, so I'll go ahead and just kind of read them out. So somebody at so Earl asked, what is your favorite type of film to direct? Oh, uh, I think the favorite type of film to direct is the one with good stories. Um, I I think I also love doing like action. I think just because my background is action and it's really, you know, really, really fun to direct action because you get to be a part of the choreography and the, you have to like pick the angles. You know, when you shoot like, like a fighting scene, right? In the US, usually when you punch, you don't actually punch. You're like, like, a, like let's say the hand and like what you're punching is like, a distance you know so it's like it's like more of the camera angle that and the reaction that sells it and you know that's always like fun to like do um action sequences because you you have like all this thing that's like coming together and you see it like oh on screen it's like it doesn't look fake it it, it really sells you know that this guy is getting punched and like he's in pain you know that kind of stuff <laughs> But I also really enjoy documentary. Actually, when you do documentary, um, when you film it, it's like vacation. You like, because when you shoot narrative, um, you're shooting to a script and you have like to finish this many pages a day so that you're not late um, with the schedule and you're not going over budget, right? So it's it can be stressful, you know? 
Whereas like documentary, you're finding the story as you're filming. So you're kind of like vacationing in Bali and just finding good, good moments, good stories, you know, to tell. So in a sense that like documentary, like filming is like really, really fun. Um, it's just in editing, then you're very stressed because you have like so much footage um, that you have to figure out the this, this story then. Whereas like narrative, like in the editing process, you, you're following a script. And when you're shooting, you're following a script. So during the editing, you have different takes but it's, you already kind of know how it's going to look like when this, when, you know, well, how this film is going to look like at the end because of, of all this like script and the filming with the script, that kind of stuff. Right. So, so action films, you really kind of have the vision more than the vision you have it, the script really in kind of the steps, but with documentaries, you're, you're almost open to kind of capturing what is happening yeah. in front of you. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's super interesting. Um, so Zoe asked, Livia, in your career as a director, have you noticed an increase in collaborative projects between people from different countries as globalization has increased? Yes, I think so. Um, especially, especially now that there's so many platform um, that you can like display your work on. And I think like um, there's definitely like people that want to, you know, like, that want to, like, at least showcase it in different parts or, like, collaborate or sh shoot in different countries, you know, definitely, like, for sure. Awesome. And so I know, so Brendan raised his hand. I'm going to go ahead and give him special access to, to ask. Go ahead. Uh -huh. um, hey, um, so I know you had mentioned, uh, you know, with the background in, um, you know, stunt work and whatnot as well. But um, I was just curious, like, uh, you know, across the board, when um, you're filming these scenes, like in the uh, the real Dave displayed earlier, um, you know, like a fighting scene, for example. Um, I was just curious, like uh, breaking down, you have all these components, like the choreography and, and so on. But um, just from your perspective, I was kind of curious, like, how long does a, you know, a typical or standard, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, match or like a, a little fight or something like, how long do those take? And, um, you know, are there, uh, what kind of like impact is going on? And, and again, the choreography, like how much of it is planned? Um, you know, just, I guess, ultimately, like how challenging or how, um, you know, how, how uh, I, I guess, how much time and whatnot do these type of scenes take? Okay, yeah, so... For um, action sequence, like fighting scenes, it's definitely take a lot longer than um, dramatic scenes. So uh, like, especially in the US, when you're doing fights, you don't actually have contact. And let's say like the person missed the punch and it's not gonna accidentally get punched because there's like a distance between the one person fighting to the other one. So you have to like, so usually, okay, sorry, let, let, let's start from, from beginning. So usually you look at the script, right? The script can be as detailed as like, oh, this person um, throw a jab and then knee this guy, or sometimes it's say they fight, you know? So when it says they fight, then, you know, you kind of like have to figure out, oh, is this like three punches or is this gonna be like three minutes or gonna be like 10 minutes, you know? So first you, you try to, to do whatever the script says, but when the script don't tell you anything, then you, you know, you have to like make a interpretation, right? And then usually you wanna have a rehearsal just because like during the day of filming, um, there's like so many things going on, right? And, and you're paying all the crew, you're paying the location. You don't wanna be like wasting money like figuring out how you're gonna choreograph this so you choreograph beforehand because when you're in the choreography session you could just go with the the people who's like involved like the, the fighters and you know maybe like the, the the fight choreographer maybe a couple more people but it's not that big um not not that many people whereas during the shoot it could be like 100 200 people that's waiting for you to discuss the choreography so you uh -huh. definitely don't want to waste that time and money right so you usually want to rehearse it um with the small group. is it planned 
It's I'm what? sorry. Is it is it planned down to like each individual uh, punch, for example, or is there? I mean, I guess that would be dependent on the situation. But in your you know experience, is yeah. it? Um, so sometimes it, most of the time is planned, especially if it's like a long choreography. You want to plan it as much as possible, and ideally, if you already pick the angles where you want to shoot it from, um, because like during the shoot day. The, the fighter, the angle, and where the camera is has to be exact because if the camera is not in the right angle, it will look like they didn't get punched correctly, you know? So so the, the, why is this action sequence taking so long? Because, you know, when you're doing dialogue, you're just doing dialogue, right? The camera just have to like capture it. Whereas this uh -huh. one, the camera is, let's say the camera move in while this guy punch and the angle is wrong or the actor move and now it's exposed that it has a gap, then you have to redo it. So the camera needs to be correct. The fighter needs to be correct. They need to stand exactly where they're supposed to stand. That's why this kind of thing takes so long. So the more you uh -huh. can grab, and you know, like even now, like when you have like, like your phone, you could just shoot it with your phone and kind of like figure out the angle. And then like you can pre-edit it so that like, during the shoot day, you know it's gonna work or not. You know? So you really don't want to waste time because you're paying like you know 100 people, 200 people on set. So any like second you waste, that's probably like ten thousand dollar. Like you know, like minute can cost like ten thousand dollar, like twenty thousand dollar. So it's you know, and and you already have that stress that you need to be like finish this five pages today. You know, so the more you can prep, the better. And you know, you could just shoot it with your phone edit it and see if you don't like it, shoot it again, edit it and see until you like it. And then you, you know, sometimes I have the, like the, 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 the cinematographer come in too. Like sometimes you're like, Hey, you know, it would be cool if we do this, I want to do this angle or that angle. Can you adjust it? And this kind of thing can take some time. So it's better like to do it during rehearsal where you're only like paying like 10 people versus 200 people on set. Yeah. Ah, understood. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I'm going to ask just a couple more questions, Levy. I know we're um, we're, we're running um, towards the end of the hour, so just a couple more questions. So Nancy asks, um, in Bali Beats of Paradise, how did you find the little boy who acted in the movie? He's a great actor. Yeah. So actually, uh, the little boy is the relative of uh, Mr. Wenton. So that was we got really lucky because he was really good. And um, he was actually just learning how to dance. So it was perfect because in the, in the, in the, because we recreated like a few scenes of uh, Mr. Wenton when he was, he was um, young and just starting to dance. So it was like very natural because the boy also just started to dance, you know? So, and we, we got, we got really lucky that he was really good, um, you know, for the camera and like with the whole process. So we have another question from Chuck. So are there documentaries where the features are paid by the people or companies in the documentary? So are there what? So are there documentaries where the features are paid by the people or companies in the documentary? So I'm not sure if the question is, um, are there companies kind of paying for the documentary or sponsoring it? For um, my documentary? Mm -hmm. So for, for this documentary, like for the funding, we um, had a philanthropist that paid for it. However, like during the marketing process, um, this is after we film everything and the film is done, we got a lot of like uh, companies that sponsor to help out the marketing. And um, in exchange, they have like, you know, like for example, like the backdrop has their logo for their promotion. And um, they also give out like um, samples of their products, you know, and this was, we actually um, got um, corporate sponsorship so that we can like show the documentary to more people. Cause you know, like sometimes we do screening um, that we made it free so more people can access and somebody has to pay for it. So we raised this money um, during marketing so that more people can watch it. Um, and we, we partnered with like banks, um, coffee, uh, coffee company and uh, detergent like variety of company that really like 
uh, believe in the in the culture, promoting culture and education, and yeah, and they sponsor a lot of like um, the screenings, you know, so more people can watch it. And that was like the goal from the very beginning to to have as many people watch it as possible, um, whether it's you know through people paying in theaters or through like company sponsoring screening so that we can like make a free screening, you know? Yeah. Well, and I know in that film in particular, that was on, uh, you had an airline that was actually showing it during flights, right? Yeah, we, Singapore Airline um, bought the rights. They showed it, um, they showed it in their flights and then um, Garuda Indonesia, the Indonesian plane also like played it. And we also like, um, we we did like the the kind of like the standard um, like we it was in theater and then it was on the um, you know like it was like it's it's online if you go to bellyvisofparadise.com you can see where it's playing and um, it was in in the plane and we we played it in like different universities as well you know so we really try our best to like reach as many audience as we could. Right, so there's really kind of like a pre and a post funding slash sponsorship cycle. Like yeah. different yeah. people fund the start of it, but then of course you get sponsors attached to it. Yeah. You know, yeah. Once, once it's done. And so uh, just the last question. So this is from Lauren and she asks, to what extent do American films shape perception of life in the US for people in Bali or in Indonesia who are watching them? So like, are do, do Indonesians, People typically like think, hey, you know, I, I'm watching these American movies. This must be how Americans live. Yeah, yes, for sure. It affects like the perception because actually, um, like for example, in Indonesia, like a lot of the film we watch growing up is like Hollywood film. So it's definitely like, you know, that's affect like your perception of like, um, like, you know, when you think of LA, you think of Beverly Hills kind of situation, because that's what you see in the film. And, you know, like not, it's it's not like so easy to just like go vacation in the US, you know, um, for us. So yeah, it's definitely like big, big, you know, and I think like movie in general really like, you know, it can, you know, it really can like affect people's perception. It really, it's like, a media that can, you know, that can go a long ways in the sense that like, you know, it can teach people something, it can, you know, affect people's life and that kind of stuff. Yeah, definitely. Yep. And probably for the good and the bad, right? Like, yes, yes, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Livy, we, I've had so much fun talking with you and thank you so much for, for answering questions. And uh, I think this, again, this is a really cool opportunity for people just to hear from you. And we could sit here and talk for hours um, because you're such an interesting person and you're doing interesting work. How might um, the listeners follow along with your work and see what, you know, what films you have out there whenever you release a future film? Like, what's the best way for them to follow you? Oh, so um, we, we have a website, Sun and Moon Films. Um, that's our website or livycheng.com. And I have Facebook and Instagram, just Livy Cheng. You know, you can add me on Facebook or you know, follow me on Instagram. I try to post more sometimes. When I'm working, sometimes I forget to post. So, so, so but I'm like, there's a new year resolution to post more in the social media. So hopefully <laughs> that will happen. <laughs> yeah, but thank you uh, so much for attending um, the Zoom today. And I really, you know, enjoyed sharing and thanks Dave for inviting me as well. Absolutely. I, we, I loved it. So we'll, we'll have to do it again, Libby. And thank you so much. Uh, please tell your, your brother and your mom that we say hello. Uh, and I hope you have a great night. You too. Thank you. All right. Thank you.